Great. Welcome to today's session. My name is Jeremy Snyder. I'm the founder and CEO of Firetail. I want to welcome you all to API Days 2023. Uh, this is the presentation for the New York City and virtual uh, API Days in May of 2023. As I mentioned, my name is Jeremy. I'm with a company called Firetail. And today we want to talk to you about some of the things we observed in analyzing a decade of API breaches. And you'll see the subheading there, courtesy of application flaws. So I know that kind of gives away some of the conclusions, but let's get into it. I'm really happy to be with you today. And uh, if you have any questions after the fact, please do feel free to email me. You can see my email address there. So, all right. So what if we learn from a decade of API data breaches? Well, let's first start by talking about how we actually gathered the data and started to analyze the data. So I want to talk about our methodology a bit for a second. So. Uh, first of all, of course, we use Google. We Googled things like API data breaches, API data leaks, API hacks, API events, things like that. Um, we also subscribe to a number of RSS feeds, industry newsletters, etc. We have triggers for notifications around data breaches, actually just broader data breaches. And so when we see data breaches that come from other factors, we always dive in and we try to do analysis. And you know, one of the first questions we ask ourselves is, OK, a data breach happened was an API either the primary or maybe a secondary breach vector or one of the ways that the attackers got in and got the data, et cetera. Second thing, we always look for kind of primary and secondary breach vectors. And we're going to talk about some of the conclusions around that. But part of this is really informed by our team's history in the cybersecurity space. You know, I myself spent about 13 years hands on in cybersecurity and IT for a couple SaaS companies and then for a video game company. And so I've got kind of the defender's experience and a little bit of learning around, you know, it's it's rarely just one thing that goes wrong. It's usually a combination of factors together that leads to, you know, compromises, breach events, et cetera. So we try to classify what's the primary breach vector, what's the secondary breach vector. Um, we do also enclose responsible disclosure. So there's a lot of security research, and actually, I'd say the amount of security research around APIs has gone up a lot in the last couple of years. I think particularly under you know pandemic lockdown restrictions, you know a lot of transactions and business functions went online. They went digital, many of them for the first time. And so we had companies shifting to the cloud. We had companies uh, creating APIs at a very, very rapid speed. And a lot of security researchers rightly assumed that there would be a lot of vulnerabilities and new vulnerabilities and, and uh, uh, you know, kind of, let's say, possible compromises that would happen as a result of that. So one thing that we do in our own data tracker is we do include these responsible disclosures, but we attribute a zero record count to them unless there is a specifically, hey, X volume of data was actually gained through this responsible disclosure research. Um, so if a, if a researcher says, hey, I was able to download 100 million records to prove this thing was there, then we'll include that. But if they say, hey, we just found the flaw, we disclosed the flaw, you know, no further discussion, then we put that as a zero record count. One other thing to disclose here is we try as best as possible to align to the OWASP API top 10. So if you look at our breach tracker, you look at some of our data, you will see those uh, OWASP IDs uh, in there. And that is what we're using is the 2019 version, the current version I'll talk about in just a second, obviously being a release candidate as of the time of recording, uh, isn't really, you know, kind of public uh, or public consumption just yet. So that's a little bit about the methodology. Um, so some of the caveats and limitations because of that, obviously, this is based on publicly reported data. There are just a couple of exceptions where we had uh, tips from people who were connected to the events who were able to kind of give us information about how or why something that may not have appeared to be related to an API actually was an API breach um, or vice versa. Um, we've also excluded a couple events for that same uh, reason. Um, so yeah, there's just a couple exceptions around that. Uh, we do examine as many sources around a breach event as possible but sometimes only one source is available. Um, so there are certainly some cases where it's sort of limited information as far as what we're able to understand about the breach event itself. Uh, we do not try to replicate the results. So we don't go try to, you know, exfiltrate data from organizations who might have been indicated in any of these breach events. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we have not yet recategorized based on the uh, 2023 OWASP API top 10 release candidate since that is not yet finalized. Um, and there's a couple of analysis things that we really wanted to get to uh, by the time we published this data, but unfortunately we weren't able to complete that in time. And, and uh, we uh, you know, had some events coming up where we needed to present these uh, learnings. And so you'll see we've not yet analyzed by let's say API type. We're looking at kind of like four primary API types that you can see listed on screen there. Uh, we've also not analyzed based on let's say cloud providers or code languages, which are things that we think are actually really interesting uh, but we've not, you know, not yet gotten to. And then, of course, you know, just going back to that first point, because this is public uh, disclosure, um, the list is almost certainly incomplete. There are, you know, 99% probably more API breach events that have happened in the world than those that we know about. Great. Um, I do also want to give a hat tip to Akamai. I know this is actually a little bit dated by now, but you know, if you're here and you're starting to think about like understanding APIs as an attack surface, um, please do read back to this. This is the 2021 version, the uh, API is the attack surface that connects us all. I find it to be a really great starting point for people kind of getting up to speed on API security, what it is and so on. We're going to kind of assume for the audience of today's presentation that we're a little bit more advanced. So um, if anything goes over your head, you know, maybe refer back to this as a good starting point and, uh, you know, just feel free to reach out to ask any questions. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We're obviously at API Days, so all of you in the room here or online watching this talk virtually, um, you know, you know how important APIs are. Um, you know, one common conclusion, like with any technology, technology is growing, technology is also a problem. You know, I've spent about a decade working in the cloud space, and that, that was very much the pattern that we saw. With the rise of cloud, with the growth rates in cloud, the growth rates and breaches on cloud platforms was, was very much a thing. Similar behavior there, we see sprawl as one of these things that accompanies every new piece of technology. Um, again, going back to my experience in the cloud space in the 2016, 17, 18 timeframe, every enterprise customer that we worked with you, we would show them a report of all the cloud infrastructure that they that we discovered using our methodologies, and they were always surprised at just how much was out there. Similarly, organizations largely don't understand just how much APIs, uh, how many APIs they have, and what all of them are, uh, or, or things like you know what data is being processed through those APIs. API attacks are up quite a bit. I apologize, uh, slightly dated statistic there. I wasn't able to uh, uh, update this with a 2022 stat. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I would really point out here is, you know, close to a billion with a B records are at exposure risk since 2013. That's one of the high level conclusions from our research. And when we look back over the last kind of decade, you know, us being in 2023 right now, we look back over 10 years and it really is around that 2013 timeframe. I think the first disclosure we saw was in 2011 uh, of an API based uh, data breach. But, um, you know, it is just over a decade that we've seen. Of course, I know we're all familiar with this kind of Gartner prediction that, you know, API abuses will move from an infrequent to the most frequent attack vector. Here we are in 2023. One thing I will say is I don't believe that that has come to pass. I still think uh, business email comp compromise, phishing, et cetera, is still, you know, the, the number one attack vector. Um, now, one thing I will talk about is kind of actually the impact of breaches, because I think that's an interesting point. We'll dive into that later on in today's presentation. Um, some high level stats, uh, 577 million records breached, and that's like fully breached, you know, proven to have been exfiltrated out of organizations. Um, you know, on average, over the last 10 years, we've seen 13 million records per breach event, uh, 43 unique documented breach research events that went into the report that we uh, have just commissioned. Um, by the way, you can find that report on our website, uh, just firetail.io. You'll see the banner around it. And we can break down the top attack vectors into a few categories. Um, a lot of those categories really do align to the OWASP top 10, but there's a couple things I want to talk about that are slightly don't align with that OWASP API top 10. So let's let's talk about some of that for a second. So obviously the attack vectors for APIs, I think it won't be a huge surprise to anybody when we analyze the data. Um, and we've analyzed this both in terms of, let's say volume of records and in terms of number of breach events. So this is kind of a weighted averaging across those. Um, authentication and authorization really take the cake. I mean, they are by far the number one and number two. Um, you can see, you know, the the next most common uh, 
thing around configuration, um, which typically refers to like accidental exposure of a private API that got made public through something like a, a network topology change or a change in security group or firewall rules um, is a distant third at 7% on the primary attack vector scale. Um, so really on authentication and authorization, what are we talking about here? We're talking about an API that either has no authentication or has very, very simple authentication or poorly designed authentication. You know, some examples of this are things like um, uh, breach events where a, uh, a sorry, um, a driver's license number or a social security number or some other piece of data that can be somewhat easily found out uh, is used as the authentication token. And as a result of that, anybody who can get that number can then you know start to access an API and start to um, start to interact with it and transact with it. Second is the, on the authorization point. You know, authorization and authentication are two separate things that often get equated by developers and people kind of you know designing, coding, and launching APIs. Um, obviously, authentication refers to who I am, and that's really establishing you know my identity as a user of an API or just as an individual. You know, I am Jeremy. Authorization is that second question of, you know, what should Jeremy be able to do? We're going to talk in a little bit more detail in just a second about some of the things we've seen around authorization. Obviously, if you're familiar with the um, OWASP API top 10, you'll see things like um, BOLA or BOLA or BFLA or BIFLA, as it's sometimes pronounced, you know, broken object level authorization and broken function level authorization. Um, so there's kind of two flavors of it, which is to say, you know, from an authorization perspective, it's not only about what can I do, it's also about what data can I access. And then there's actually even, you know, kind of an intersection of that, which is, you know, there are there's data that I can access that I can do some things with versus data that I can access that I can do other things with. Um, just as a simple example to try to illustrate some of that distinction, it's, you know, I can edit and modify my own social media profile, but I can only view other people's profiles, right? So view permissions on everybody's profile, view plus edit on my own profile. And then similarly, you know, I can delete my own profile, but I can't delete anybody else's profile. So that's some of the examples there of where, you know, that authorization line is kind of, you know, multi-factor. Um, and I know like multi-factor in this context is kind of funny, but you know, there's multiple ways or multiple types of authorization that we need to think about, um, whether it's records or function based. And then, you know, it couples with authentication, but they are not the same thing. So what is one of the conclusions that we kind of took away from that? It's actually that this is a logical flaw. So we looked at all the different levels of um, things like, let's say, log files around APIs to try to understand, is there something in the logs that we can pick up that says, an event is or is not authorized when we look at it from a network perspective or from an API gateway or a web application firewall or something like that. And what you find is there's really no connection between that data and what you get from an application that is actually storing and processing the permissions. So we classify authorization as a logical flaw. And I think that's a, a pretty common classification from a security perspective. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that we've seen as common um, common patterns or common, let's say, like breach events, uh, breach event types, I guess, is the right way to think about it. Um, so we've got the authenticates once, but then doesn't require any, uh, any subsequent authorization. So, you know, a lot of the times there's an assumption that if a user is authenticated, what that user will be able to see or do will be controlled by the client. And in many cases, that's something like a mobile app or an IoT device, or maybe even just the front end of a, of a um, decoupled enterprise web app, like a SaaS platform or a SaaS application. Um, and so, you know, they, they assume that, hey, once I've authenticated as Jeremy, what's going to get returned is all the things that I'm able to do, and I will only ever do those things. So it's kind of relying on the client to, um, to only present to me the things that I am authorized to do. So that's one very, very common behavior that we've seen. Um, and it's kind of, you know, those first two points on the screen here really try to, to illustrate that point. Some of the conclusions there, obviously, you know, we talked about it just a second ago, authentication and authorization are not the same thing. One of the things we've seen very common in these is that you have to do these controls on the server side. 
let's talk about why for a second. So that example that I gave just a second ago about, you know, logging in, authenticating as Jeremy, and then getting presented a set of functions that I do have access to, that's great as long as I'm interacting with the API only through that client. And one thing that we've seen in every responsible disclosure, in every breach event, um, people don't breach data using your own software or using your own mobile client. You know, it's basically, you can sum it up to hackers don't play by your rules. Um, so that is, you know, a real strong reason why you cannot rely on enforcing these controls inside the client. Um, another thing that we've seen is you have to do this with every call. Um, and there's a whole number of reasons, everything around, let's say, like session timing, so on and so on. Um, you know, that is something that it, we've seen again and again as well. Uh, you cannot assume that, you know, my login session is responsible for, for taking this because I might do things like extract that, uh, get that out of a cookie, share a cookie, a cookie might get breached, all of these types of things, right? Secondarily, when we look at authorization, um, you know, we talked a minute ago about kind of the uh, object level authorization and function, function level authorization. Um, and so what we, we kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, really the model around this, and this is, you know, a known authorization structure is you really need three pieces of information, the principal plus the resource plus the action. So it's Jeremy, what he's trying to do and the data record he's trying to do that with. And the best practice around authorization is, is, uh, is pretty much kind of a zero trust model. Unless you can get to yes, the authorization response is a no. I found this quote on archive.org on an article that uh, is no longer public on the web, but it does analyze API security. And I thought this quote was actually really, you know, illustrates the point. Vulnerabilities in apps handling API data are the direct cause of these breaches. Nothing else is to blame. One of the other really interesting findings from our perspective in analyzing all these events is that typically two things go wrong, at least two things go wrong, there might be more, but basically all breach events are multi-vector. So when we, um, in our methodology, when we look at API breaches, we start with kind of, you know, what's the first thing that we identified that went wrong? What's the second thing that we identified that went wrong? And sometimes that's available, sometimes it's not, there's a few that are not. Um, but what was interesting here is that, you know, where you have uh, where you have a authorization based primary uh, breach vector, you have an authentication based primary uh, secondary breach vector. So that could be things like you know weak tokens or bad uh, lack of timeouts around that. So long lived authentication credentials that can be shared, compromised, etc. Um, we've seen injection as a case here on the secondary side. I'll comment on that in just a second. But then governance and data exposure also show up quite a lot in here. We're going to talk about those in just a minute as kind of um, additional breach vectors to be aware of and to start thinking about. Uh, so some cases to, to kind of illustrate some of this like multi-vector conclusion. So we've seen cases where you, let's say you had no surfer side authorization. So I'm able to authenticate, get a token, issue follow-up API calls. And then based on that, I see things like ID numbers. And so I can try to enumerate sequentially other ID, other data records using sequential ID numbering. And we've seen that work in a number of cases. So, you know, best practice there is use a UUID or a GUID that is, you know, either random or very hard to guess or hard to uh, brute force. Uh, we've also seen a lack of authorization controls coupled with full data records being returned. Um, this is a super common pattern. This goes back to data exposure. So what this really refers to is, you know, you might have a mobile client or a, uh, let's use that social media profile example again, you might have a social media profile that shows, let's say my name and my, uh, my first name, my last name and my profile picture. But actually the API returned my first name, my last name, my profile picture, plus my home address, my email address, how long I've been using the site, the date I signed up, those types of things. So full data records are, are quite often returned Sometimes it's as easy as looking in your uh, web browser developer tools to see the entire data record coming back from the API call. Um, so that's a, a real challenge. Um, also, we've seen things like third-party API keys that have been discovered. So some bad habits around uh, just like key management and sprawl. Uh, 
Um, but then also like a lack of encryption around that. So uh, you can find a key. The key wasn't stored in any encrypted uh, method. It's just easy to plug and play. Um, and similarly, things like, you know, let's say the data that's coming back is not uh, not encrypted in any way tied to that key. Uh, other common things that we've seen. So we've seen cases where uh, a, the first factor for authentication was something like a vehicle ID number or social security number. Um, and then the second factor is an equally weak piece of information, something like, um, so if you take that vehicle ID number, it's something like the car model or maybe like the, um, uh, the, the model year, the sales point, something like that, that is also easily discovered or easily kind of guessed from a limited risk, a limited list of possibilities. Um, so that's those are some of the patterns that we've seen, and we've seen kind of you know multiple events on some of these things. Great. Other notes around some of the va attack vectors that we've been tracking, and some of kind of let's say the real world context around that right now. Um, we use a lab environment where we test a lot of things. Uh, you know, we do see with APIs just like with almost anything. As soon as you put something online within about five minutes, it's being probed and scraped. And we've seen that with or without DNS records. We've seen that with raw IP addresses. We've seen that with cloud-based ephemeral IP addresses. Um, really, you know, there's kind of active probing going on against pretty much any IP range all the time. Uh, we do see return callers. So we use a, a methodology to identify a caller as a combination of IP address plus user agent plus a couple other things. Um, with those return calls, we do see specific types of probing. Um, so it's some of it is very generic kind of bot traffic to scrape whatever, uh, maybe like look for a site map that you can use to kind of scrape content. But others, we do see cases where, you know, specifically looking for like environment variables, git config, et cetera. Uh, data exposure we talked about already. I won't repeat that. One surprising finding for us was that injection was not super common. Uh, we saw it in only about 10% of cases. I, I've been surprised there because I do think as an application flaw, it's one of the things that could be leveraged probably more frequently. Um, I'll be surprised if we don't see more of it going forward. So let's see if that happens. And then governance is kind of, if you look at our research and you're like, hey, what does governance mean? Um, it's a general term. It does refer to things like configuration changes. One of the common things that we've seen is private a private APIs that get accidentally made public through something like, again, a network topology change, an IP address change, a security group change, et cetera. Uh, one other kind of theme, API flaws have broad impact. So the flaws tend to be systemic and so they can be attacked systematically. So, um, you know, when we do see something like an authorization logic flaw, it generally exposes either an entire function or an entire data set, or maybe both. And so um, in a lot of the responsible disclosures, researchers have often exfiltrated very large proofs of concept um, and then you know, shared that with the, uh, with the organization behind the API. Um, sometimes that's in the hundreds of millions. Um, so the average number of records per breach is still in the millions. If you look at our research and you see like that number coming down, just bear in mind, it's coming down as a result of more, a, more publicly disclosed API breaches. So the volume of breaches has actually picked up quite a bit of the volume of breach events, I should say, um, to make it clear. So we've seen, you know, in the first, uh, first couple of quarters of this year, we've seen, you know, that we're on pace to have more events this year than we did last. Uh, some other observations, uh, these are not industry specific or geographic specific, so APIs are everywhere, you know, but there have been some interesting kind of industry uh, observations that we've seen. And I think a couple of them, you know, technology being on that list is not surprising because guess what, you know, tech companies build a lot of software and so there's a lot of APIs, right? But two other industries that I'll highlight that I think are really interesting to think about are manufacturing and hospitality. Automotive in particular has had a rough time in the last, last quarter of 2022, plus the beginning of this year, there've been a lot of disclosures. Um, and what you can see there is there's a broad partner network, right? So even on the manufacturing side, you've got a whole supply chain of third parties working together. And then on the distribution side, you've got dealers, distributors, car, uh, sorry, you've got manufacturers, distributors, car dealers, um, service uh, stations and uh, um, mechanics and so on. So you've got a really broad ecosystem. And then similarly on the hospitality side, you think about like airlines and, and hotels and rental cars, you know, you can book all that stuff direct with the vendor, but there's also, you know, 
all these travel aggregator sites and online travel agencies and so on. So uh, again, kind of broad partner ecosystems with a lot of, of communication also leads to these API risks. Um, so what are some API security recommendations? Well, you know, this top six list has is probably not super new. Um, I, I won't go through every point on here, but, you know, just like we saw with cloud, we see that developers get ahead of security. And so there's a lack of awareness from the uh, security side as far as, you know, what APIs are, are in use. Some of the perimeter security stuff, everybody knows how to use firewalls. So when we talk about perimeter security, it's really kind of understanding what are the roles of the different network controls and network functions in place in front of APIs. So that's things like API gateways and WAFs and so on. What can they and can't they do relative to API security? Um, and then the rest of the things I'll, I'll just leave up here, but these are common things, you know, number five and number six, change management and communication are always a problem around this. Um, one interesting point I do want to bring up from, uh, again, from that uh, Akamai State of the Internet report, I think one thing that is kind of a, a common misconception is that you can solve API security through network controls. And, you know, I think this, this quote really illustrates, um, you know, part of the reason around that. And hopefully our research also helps to to try to illustrate, you know, why you can't think about it that way. Um, here's the link to the breach tracker. You'll obviously find the report on our website. Um, so one thing, you know, I just want to leave as a closing thought for everybody. If you're thinking about starting an API security program at your organization, what should you think about? And what we've kind of, let's say, summarized from our, our customer interactions is really, you know, start with kind of discovery, visibility, and observability. Um, if you don't know what you have, obviously you can't protect it. But once you know what you have, you need to kind of observe it, watch it for a little while to understand which APIs are, are public, which ones are, are pushing PII through them, which ones are executing cri critical business functions. So that's that observability piece, because you typically can't solve API security for the entire organization, or you may not be able to solve it all at once. So you need to prioritize just like with anything. And then you get to enforcement and kind of policy analysis. And then one last point here that I'll, I'll just mention is kind of central audit comes up in a lot of conversations. APIs can run anywhere, on-prem, in the cloud, any flavor of compute on the cloud. All of these things log to different locations. We actually see a lack of API logging uh, right now across a lot of the organizations that we talk to. They haven't gotten to the point where, for instance, they're sending their API logs or records to a central location so that if there is an incident and they need to do forensics or incident response, they have one place to go to. Um, so when we think about kind of the adoption path, what we see that really translating to is discovery and inventory, kind of a policy assessment, uh, turn on audit for lower priority, and then turn on enforcement for higher priority and look at attack prevention there. And that's kind of the path that we've seen. Um, yeah, quick uh, bonus for those that are like at, let's call it phase two, um, where do we see API security fitting into like a CI CD pipeline? You've got source code analysis, vulnerability elimination, fuzzing and logic pre-launch. And then when you think about runtime, you wanna cover the top attack vectors and then have centralized detection and response. And you want to contextualize that into something like a CNAP or an AppSec program. Um, you want to focus on API security at the application layer as a best practice. Why only at that layer can you see all the things you need to see? I won't dwell on this chart. Feel free to screenshot it, et cetera. Just as a reminder, why? Because authentication authorization are at the app logic layer, and that's where the breaches are happening. And there you have it. Thank you so much for joining me today. Again, my name is Jeremy Snyder with the company called Firetail. Thank you for watching this uh, API Days 2023 New York City and virtual. Hopefully this has been helpful for you. Thanks for your time.